our final speaker, but as I said, we've left the best to last uh, in terms of Arik and Melinda, and it's Melinda tankard Reese. Welcome back to the podium. Can I have the remote, please? <laughs> remote. Bob's taking it. Bob's getting a smack for taking the remote. Actually, it's quite interesting that what uh, Eric has been sharing with us relates to my talk, because in many ways my talk is also about the devaluing of motherhood. Um, and I, I like the way that Eric's first talk tied in very nicely with mine, and I think the one he's just given us does as well. So I'm going to be speaking about my work on, on abortion and about women's experiences of abortion and cutting through those myths about abortion being quick, easy, safe, you can get on with your life and you can have a whole new life. We'll be looking at what research tells us uh, and also at women's personal experiences and again what we can do to create alternative, real pro-life, pro-life-affirming um, alternatives for women. And I'll be touching on my second book as well, Defined Birth, and that's about abortion and disability and the messages that we're sending about disability when we're wiping out an entire category of people, again, because we as a society don't want to make space for them. So in the year 2000, I had uh, this book published called Giving Sorrow Words. This book's also been uh, reprinted many times, Women's Stories of Grief After Abortion. And I wrote this book because I felt that in the very heated debate around abortion, we heard very little about women's experiences. And uh, I didn't think that we could fully understand the issue without hearing from women who had been through it. And uh, so I placed an ad in uh, women's magazines. You may not be able to read that very well, but uh, I put ads in New Woman, Cosmo, Clio, and it just said abortion loss, writer seeks women to contribute first-hand accounts of pain and loss following pregnancy termination for a book. It had appeared in the middle of the lingerie and hair removal ads. I've always liked to, to be in the marketplace, and uh, here we have a classic example of, of being in the marketplace. I was overwhelmed with responses. I heard from teenagers, from elderly women, from migrant women, from poor women, from rich women, from women who had had one or two abortions and others who had had five and one who had 12 abortions. And I want to share these stories with you because I think that if we're going to make any impact at all on this issue, we have to understand what abortion does to women. Now, there were three themes common to all of the stories. That was the grief, the lack of proper counselling and information, and the lack of real choice and support. The lack of real choice. So I argue in this book that it's, it's a myth to talk about the right to choose when the only choice was abortion. You can't talk about the right to choose when women are only offered one choice. And they're really offered the choice to be mothers. They're offered the choice not to be mothers and not to be supported in being mothers, uh, particularly in less than so-called perfect circumstances. We hear a lot about so-called unwanted pregnancy, but we need to start talking about unwanted abortion because that's the reality. The research tells us that 80% of women would have preferred to have made another choice had that choice been forthcoming. So they were the three themes. Women were not aborting because they were exercising some wonderful reproductive right, but because they felt pressured and coerced into unwanted abortion. So let's unpack the stories of grief first. Women who leave their beds at night to, breastfeeding, to breastfeed a crying baby now, this is an aborted baby, but a number of women told me they could hear the baby crying in the night because their, their whole bodies were geared up, geared, getting ready to breastfeed a baby. Women who buy teddy bears, they pretend to their babies. Women who cut themselves. Women who visit the grave of someone else's dead baby. Women who make a birthday cake every year and blow out the candles. These are some of the experiences of lasting emotional shock and chronic sadness that I collected. Jane said, the pain is indescribable. The abortion has blown my life apart, blown my entire self, psyche, soul, belief in myself apart. It has devastated me. Another Jane, who was 19, had an abortion in Melbourne. She said, I still get emotional when I see young children, especially young babies. I look at them and think, I killed one of you. I always wish I'd kept it. Would it be a boy or a girl? What would I call him or her? Would he or she look like me? 
I even recorded the day my baby was due to be born on my calendar. I wish I'd done what I wanted to do about my pregnancy, not what everyone else wanted me to do. After all, it was inside me, it was part of me, and now I have to live with this guilt for the rest of my life. Melanie said, Melanie, you didn't say that, that slide is in the wrong place. Melanie said, over the next three months I suffered so much pain, anger and loss that I stayed home from school and I slept and I did nothing day in and day out. Every night I'd cry myself to sleep praying that God would send my baby back to me. Four months later she was pregnant again and she hid that pregnancy until she was four months along. Quote, so no one could take him away from me. Every time I look into my beautiful son's eyes, I think of how I took the life of an innocent baby several months earlier. I really believe that when I had the termination, a part of me went too. Okay, that's in the right place. Michelle said, I became slowly more and more depressed. I lost all of my motivation and drive to do anything and my ability to cope with everyday life disintegrated day by day. Sadness swept over me and shadowed every cell in my body. I started to want my baby back. My heart was broken in a way I could never imagine. I ached to the bone and in my soul as well. Every day I woke up was like another day in hell and getting out of bed was almost an impossibility. Over a six month period I lost 20 kilos. Today I'm still very angry at the abortion clinic for not warning me about the dangers of post-abortion grief. Susan said, my self-esteem plummeted. I no longer cared about work. I abandoned my studies. I drank like a fish. One night I found myself sitting in the gutter, drunk and crying, wondering what the hell was happening to me. It was like something inside me died the same time my baby died. And so many women said that over and over again. Something inside me died. My soul died. My, my, it blew my life apart. Many, many talked about the death of the soul. Susan said she felt duped, lied to, lied to, ignored, discriminated against, unloved, unsupported, violated and left for dead. Ginger said, my family is from a Holocaust background and I made my baby die in the same way, being burnt in a mass cremation with no grave and no services. Sue wrote to me, the pain feels like it wraps itself around my chest and burrows into my stomach like a poisonous worm. The grief and guilt I feel about destroying my child ricochets into my soul. The experts talk about choice, but I would not have chosen this had I known. How do I comfort myself when my insides feel like they are being fed through a mincing machine? How do I stop my chest from hurting and my arms from wanting to hold my little human being? How do I forgive myself? Julia said, abortion rips to the core of a woman in a way no other experience does. Simone said, I've lost my spirit, the core of my being, which was my soul. Life and love within has left me. Instead, there is emptiness and nothingness, a lifelessness. Where once life and love existed, now there is just misery and a void. You see this theme over and over again. Something inside me died, the death of the soul. It was a common refrain, even for women with little or no religious or faith background. They all felt, yes, there was a physical violation, Yes, there was a mental violation, but there was a spiritual violation as well. And I think this attests to the deep connection between a mother and her baby. So that was the first theme, was, was the grief. And I hope that will give you some insights into the, the suffering of women. We mustn't underrate the suffering of women I in this area. I think there's a myth that women are bought and are, are callous about it and are unfeeling about it. I, my research doesn't suggest that that is the case. So the second theme was the lack of information and the poor counselling. The right to choose is really the right not to know. This patronising attitude holds that women are such poor decision makers and so easily confused they must be denied information relevant to their future health. Abortion providers maintain power over women by controlling information about the nature of abortion, its risks and the availability of options. Abortion is the only invasive medical procedure in which the generally accepted requirements for informed consent are disregarded and opposed by so-called pro-choice groups. Abortion providers seem to only defend the choice that feeds their industry. Stories contributed to giving sorrow words raised serious questions about pre-abortion counselling. The contributors felt poorly treated in the pre-termination process. They felt cheated that abortion was presented as something quick and easy and over with when the reality turned out to be very, very different. Linda said, the counsellor asked, is this what you want to do? I said, I don't know. She said, well, you're here, so it must be end of counselling session. Another woman told me that she was put in a room with a tape recorder and told to press play and that was the counselling 
session was pre-recorded information on a tape. So again, regardless of different views on abortion, surely everyone should agree that women should be given proper information. They should, they should be respected enough to be given proper information and be treated properly. And my book again shows that they weren't. Sue, who was a teenager in Adelaide, said, they gave me no options and no information. My rights as a human being were not valid because of who I was, just another stupid teenager who got pregnant. I wanted so much to talk to someone. Maybe someone would say, don't do it, I'll help you through. Or maybe you can keep your baby. There is help available and there are people who care. But instead I was herded into a room with about 10 other girls like cattle and spoken to like I was a piece of dirt and treated as such. She, that's the rest of that. Mary, 23, said, I was in the abortion clinic. I was crying my eyes out saying over and over again, I did not want the abortion. I was desperate. I knew it was impossible for me to stand up to my boyfriend on my own, and I, but I thought this counsellor would support me and help him to see reason. Instead, she sided with him completely. I felt cornered. I was sitting down. I now had, instead she sided with him completely. I now had not one but two people vigorously haranguing me. I was saying over and over again, I want to have the baby, but the two of them just bulldozed over me completely. I felt cornered. I was sitting down and they were both standing over me. I had once received training in how to close a sale and I felt this counsellor must have been to the same sales training seminars. And that's not so far-fetched because uh, abortion clinic counsellors in the US, it's come out that they do go to sales training type seminars. They learn how to sell abortion, how to sell abortion over the phone as quickly as possible. While I was still crying my eyes out, an appointment was made for my abortion to be carried out the following week. <coughs> Kathy from Sydney said, the lady who met me at the local family planning service treated me as rudely as anyone could treat someone. There was no caring or concern in her manner. No options were presented to me. She said I was stupid to get pregnant. And as I was 18 and at university, she presumed I wanted to have an abortion. I remember asking about the difference between local and general anaesthetic. And she said, quote, have a local as then you'll know it's happened and you'll never make this mistake again. You know, they say pro-life people don't like women. They say we're cruel to women, we hate women. Look at this, look at this treatment of women. Have a local. You don't want to be completely out of it because then you'll realise what a terrible mistake you've made because you'll feel every scrape and every suction of the vacuum and then you won't be so stupid the next time around. What, what contempt for women. Sam had five abortions. She said, I had to stumble through a system which was not supportive of my emotional needs and I certainly did not make an informed decision. At no stage did they discuss the alternatives, the procedure, the possible effects or how I felt for that matter. She says, no professional created an opportunity for me to discuss anything. No one that I came across ever said to me, why is this happening to you? What is wrong? Why have you had more than one abortion? And what can we do about it? Now, it was Genevieve's story in my hometown, Canberra, that really mo motivated me to write this book. She had an absolutely horrendous experience. She hadn't wanted the abortion at all. She had a marriage breakdown. Her first child had a learning disability. She didn't know how she would cope, but she had already cancelled previous appointments. There was a lot of signs here that this is not a woman that really wants to have a termination. She says, the counsellor's approach was rushed and unsympathetic. She seemed surprised about my reluctance to proceed with the abortion. She asked, what are you afraid of? As I said, she'd already cancelled two appointments and before this third appointment, she'd spent four hours walking around the clinic trying to, trying to find other help, confused, not sure what to do. She ends up in there and she says, I collapsed in sheer exhaustion. I told her that I'd been outside for hours. I cried, hysterically curled over with my head in my hands. I said, I feel like I'm depriving my child of life. Hello, warning signs, warning signs here. A conversation was cut short by the doctor. The pressure was on. I stopped crying in disbelief and the counsellor told me if I was going to abort, I'd have to do it right now. The counsellor said, look, I'll give you five minutes to think about it, and when I come back, I want your answer. In this particular clinic, the doctor is flown in from Melbourne. So they were pressuring her to have it done right now. I couldn't speak. I couldn't believe it. Now I was going into a state of panic and shock. I could now barely speak. The counsellor glared at me, sighed a deep sigh, and immediately said, look, they're all waiting for you, you know. Now, after she had the termination, the staff clapped and said, congratulations. You know, as though she'd had a, a baby. Congratulations. 
you know, you've, you've done it. What a great achievement to, to go through with this. Ellen had a horrendous experience. She um, delivered her baby in a toilet in Melbourne after her abortion, after her abortion. And uh, this was a, a late-term abortion. And uh, she, she, she's not the only case like this. In Sydney, there was another case involving a 20-year-old woman who delivered a 20-week-old un, unborn baby into a toilet as well. Ellen's case went, went public. She got an out-of-court settlement. And she puts it so profoundly. She says, I felt cheated by a system which was trying to sweep me under the carpet by concealing the facts. They act by desensitising a very sensitive issue. Anxiously, you enter their system in a state emotionally unable to make a clear decision. Guidance is needed, not some medical magic. You come in pregnant and you go home unpregnant. Women are not machines you can clear of a mechanical fault. We have emotions and needs which have to be addressed by the medical profession. I shall suffer the emotional distress for the rest of my life. An ironic twist on a decision which was meant to make my situation easier. Now let's again have a look at specifically information that is given particularly to young women about abortion. You heard in my talk this morning I said a lot about Girlfriend magazine. My work around the pornification of culture and sexualization of girls isn't the only time I have had cause to refer to Girlfriend magazine because here is another example. Girlfriend had a, a special feature called You're Pregnant, Now What? And uh, one of the advantages of having teenage girls is that they bring home lots of things you can use in your, in your talks and in your research. And my daughter brought this home. She thought I'd be interested, as I was. You're pregnant, now what? Under the section, you won't be able to read this very well, I'm sorry, but under the section, having an abortion, which is in the middle, it says, there is no evidence that a straightforward abortion has any effect on future fertility or any aspect of general health. Lies, lying to our girls right there. And, of course, they're quoting the general manager of Murray Stopes International, the world's biggest abortion provider. Under the section where to get help, I thought at least there is a section that says where to get help. Maybe there's hope here. Who can help you? Family planning and Murray Stopes International, the world's biggest abortion clinic chain. There's also a section called keeping the baby. I thought, oh, OK, maybe there's some hope here under keeping the baby. And this is no joke. Under keeping the baby, it says... If you do this, your parents won't support you, you'll get kicked out of school, your boyfriend will leave you, and, this is seriously listed, you won't have time to read Girlfriend magazine. <laughs> oh my God, I won't have time to read Girlfriend magazine if I have a baby. In a particularly cruel warning which plays on the fears of girl's abandonment by her friends and of being left out, the girl is asked, this is a direct quote, how will you feel when your besties stop coming around because instead of reading Girlfriend and drooling over Orlando, You'll be reading a parenting guide and wiping drool off your baby's chin. That is a direct quote. Now, so many of the young women in my book wish they were wiping drool off a baby's chin. Girlfriend sagely counsels, make sure you're 100% certain before you have a baby. 100% certain. Now, I have had four babies, and I'm still not sure, <laughs> right? <laughs> Three of them are teenagers. I'm less sure than I ever was <laughs> about the decision I made. Who is 100% certain? You know, there's always doubts, there's always worries, you'll wonder how you'll go. And yet, under having an abortion, it doesn't say, make sure you're certain, not at all, because a baby is a disaster and abortion is absolutely nothing at all. That's the kind of advice that our young girls are getting from their lifestyle manual, their lifestyle bible, which is Girlfriend magazine. False advertising, again, regardless of conflicting views on abortion, should we not agree, at least, that girls should not be given false advice. And this is the tragedy. So many girls will be looking to this to know, to make a decision about what to do. So let's unpack this idea that there is no evidence of harm. Women's Forum Australia produced uh, an evidence-based review and it's about to be updated. I'm sorry I don't have the updated one. I wish it was out in time. But I'll quote from the 2006 report, which was a comprehensive evaluation of current international medical literature on the physical and mental health risks of termination. Among the findings, more death from all causes, including suicide and homicide after abortion compared with childhood. Abortion is associated with significant physical risks, including premature delivery, infection, uterine perforation, placenta previa, and possible miscarriage and low birth weight in future pregnancies. 10 to 20 per cent of women suffer severe negative psychological complications after abortion, and many more women experience emotional distress immediately after the abortion and in the months following. Depression and anxiety are experienced by substantial numbers of women, 
and after abortion, women have an increased risk of psychiatric problems, including bipolar disorder, neurotic depression, depressive psychosis, and schizophrenia. There is increased risk of substance abuse and self-harm. What abortion provided do you know tells women that before they make their decision? Uh, I would suggest none, or if they do, it's in the tiny, fine, unreadable print, which is dismissed anyway. Abortion for fetal disability is particularly traumatic and can be psychologically damaging. Having an abortion before 21 years of age doubled the risk of alcohol abuse or of developing depression and more than tripled the risk of illicit drug use. And adolescent girls who abort unintended pregnancies are five times more likely to seek help for psychological and emotional problems compared to their peers who carry their pregnancies to term. And those who have abortions have higher rates of juvenile delinquency than those who kept their babies. So everyone presents teen pregnancy as an absolute unmitigated disaster, but the outcomes are worse if they have abortions. Now, does that mean I think every teenage girl should get pregnant? No, of course it doesn't. That's not what we're saying here. Don't get me wrong. I'm not glorifying single motherhood, not at all. But let's look at the realities for girls who actually have abortions and how they end up afterwards. And uh, some significant stories, uh, research has come out of New Zealand. I probably don't need to tell you about it. Um, but again, it, it, it found that abortion increases risks of substance use disorders and psychiatric disorders in young women. And since this research I've cited, there is, there is even more compelling evidence. So I argue that women have a right to know these findings. The third theme of the book was lack of choice. Many women in the book described receiving an ultimatum from their partners, it's me or the baby, you choose. Susan said, abortion turned out to be a very convenient solution for my partner and my parents who wanted nothing to do with the pregnancy. Lisa, 19, from Queensland, had a late-term abortion to please her boyfriend. She said, my boyfriend told me if I kept the baby, it would break us apart. I loved him, and I went and destroyed a life which I'd wanted so much. I was 18 weeks pregnant, and it took three days for the operation. Men don't understand what you go through, and I wish they did. Throughout the three days, I had needles all the time and nausea. This was all because of love. I always think of other people before my own feelings but look at where it's gotten me. So a lot of women are aborting to please other people in their life. It's not really what they want. Melanie, 18, in her last year of high school, was pressured by her boyfriend and her parents to abort her pregnancy. She said, I didn't have one person to support me having the baby. You could be that one person. You could be that one person that says, I'll help you. What do you need? What is it you need? You know, you could be the one person that helps her to avoid the kind of post-abortion trauma outcomes that I've described. Let's go back. 16-year-old Adria had an abortion at the assistance of her male guardian, who was 20 years her senior, to cover up his sexual exploitation. I want to know why abortion clinics are not exposing the fact that the male sexual exploiter of the girl is bringing her in for an abortion to cover up the evidence. I argue that abortion clinics are complicit in child sexual abuse because they're covering up the evidence. They should be at the forefront of saying, this man has just brought this girl in here for an abortion and we suspect sexual exploitation. But they're not. They're complicit in covering up and hiding the evidence because abortion is a convenient way of doing that. Many abortion decisions are motivated by a lack of emotional, social and material support and financial concerns are a major motivator for abortion. Schools, university and workplaces are generally unsupportive of pregnant women and mothers. There was a case in Australia where a workplace fined a pregnant woman every time she took a toilet break. How many of you here have been pregnant? I don't expect to see any male hands, but how many? You need to, you need, you'd like to know where the toilets are, don't you? Yes. Toilets become extremely important. You'd like to know where they are um, because there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure going on. So this woman was fine every time she had to go to the toilet. And as we know, women have been sacked for being pregnant. Abortion is also strongly associated with domestic violence in the abuse of women. And this is why you know, all the work I do, my work on pornification, sexualization, violence against women, it's all pro-life work. All these things are interact, you know. Abortion helps to, to, to mop up the mess caused by a pornified society. And abortion is, is most often seen in women who are treated violently, who have a poor sense of themselves and, and respect for themselves. So all these things interrelate. Poor quality intimate relationships motivate many women to have 
abortions. And we know that many pregnant women face assault from their partners. In a study in Australia, 16% of callers to one survey mentioned violence as a contributing factor in their decision to seek advice. And tragically, many of these women think, oh, well, I can cope, I'll put up with the violence, but I don't want my child to be, to be treated violently. So in, in a way, they're trying to protect the child. So another act of violence is perpetuated. According to a survey in America, 91, 91 out of 100 aborted women wanted options to abort, abortion that were not forthcoming. And as I said earlier, 80% of women, this is a Elliott Institute research finding, would have chosen differently had support been available. So the decision to have an abortion is made under conditions of reduced freedom. Many women express a sense of isolation. They feel abandoned to their autonomy. They're told it's your choice. <laughs> we won't support you. It's your choice. The employer doesn't have to change the workplace. The school doesn't have to change at all to make sure she gets an education. It's her choice. She's on her own. She's abandoned to her autonomy and left with the results. Choice becomes an excuse to tell women, don't bother me with your problems. It's a quick fix solution, which does nothing to attack the underlying reasons behind abortion.